Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to a new demystifying series. It's officially October. So that is a brand new month. And I'm joined with two very special guests, Dustin Valkama and the man who's about to teach us everything we need to know about getting started in ZBrush, Ian Robinson. How's it going, guys? <laughs> this guy. Happy Monday, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Monday. It's awesome. I'm excited. We get to do some art. We get to learn uh, some ZBrush. So, or it's going to be good. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. I'm excited too. And good morning and hey to everyone who's live with us already. So, hey to Jim, Greg, Drake, Matt, Scott. It's nice to see you guys here. So before we get into what we're going to be doing, before I hand over to the master himself, I thought I'd talk about a few of the things that we have going on in October. So if you head over to the maxon.net events page, you can see all the stuff that we have going on as a whole collective throughout uh, the month of October. So we have our live sessions where we have VFX and Chill with Seth and Hashi, that's on Fridays. We have our Demystifying post-production, which is today, and that's gonna be every Monday. And we are blessed with five weeks. So we get five whole weeks of this series, which is, which is great. And then we also have Max on Color, which is every first and third Thursday. And then we have Ask the Trainer, which is every second and fourth Thursday. And we also have live events. So now like the world's opening up again, we get to go to these amazing live events. So we have Forward Festival, we have Broadcast India where Jonas Pills is actually gonna go and he's gonna be presenting a variety of different like workshops and topics. We have Lightbox, we have Adobe Max, where me and Dustin, we're gonna be there. We're gonna be there live in LA, which will be good fun. And then we also have NAB New York. So there's a lot going on in October, a lot of live events, a lot of live webinars. And if you ever miss any of our sessions or wanna find out about you know, the upcoming live streams, all you have to do is head over to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel, which is this little channel here. So you can see we have our live streams, so Maxon Color, Arsenal Trainer, then we also have our recent uploads and then all of the other sessions that we do. And each of those are put into their own series playlist. So for example, Demystifying Post-Production, if you ever wanna catch up on any of that, just head over to that playlist and everything's timestamped. Thanks to Dr. Sassy as well. So thank you so much for doing that Sassy. We really appreciate it. And I also wanna talk about Pixelogic, so ZBrush Live. Um, so Ian, you can probably talk, tell us a little bit more about that, but I know you guys have amazing artists who live stream uh, a couple of times a day, right? Not even not even just once a day. Yeah, yeah no, there we definitely have. So ZBrush Live, for anybody who doesn't know, is basically our live team. We have a, um, a group of artists who volunteer their time, come on to our channel, and they showcase exactly how they use ZBrush in their workflow. So anywhere from jewelry to video games, film to collectibles, to toys, to automotive, to art uh, architecture, there's all sorts of artists out there that um, are doing different things, even like the sculpting is happening. So there's a lot of different uh, ways to use ZBrush, which is partly why we're here today, to kind of demystify what ZBrush is all about and to kind of bring uh, some knowledge to the forefront of how you can use it as well, whether you're doing some sort of asset creation or full-on sculptures. Either way, ZBrush can fit into that pipeline. And these artists come on and they chase, like Ellie was saying, easily like a few times a day, every single day. I, th I think it's rare that our channel doesn't go live. We just have that many artists that want to come on and share their knowledge. So ZBrush Live is really good for that. It's also a great source um, for you to kind of ask these artists directly how they do something, um, why they do the things that they do. And each artist will have their own different answer depending on what they're actually working for. Some of us, like myself, I come from toys as a background in 3D printing. So I don't care about geometry much at all. Like if <laughs> If it's beautiful, um, great. If it's really messy, that's fine. As long as my sculpture looks good and at the end of the day I can manufacture it, I don't really care. Whereas there are some that are like, oh, we do full video game and film pipelines, so we need clean UVs. We need to make sure that our geometry looks nice. So whatever method you're actually trying to look for, this is what we can do, and this is what ZBrush Live can also help with. So we have ZBrush Live, and I definitely recommend checking them out. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. So finally, before we, you know, 
hand over to you and get into what we're actually going to be covering over this month. Uh, inside of GoToWebinar, there is a handout section for you all. And we like to say thank you for, for you being part of these live sessions by giving away a free t-shirt. And so you can access the, it's like a different merch store link. It's like a secret one, not the main one. And you can find that on there. And then the password is Spooky Sculpts because we like to keep it on theme and it is Halloween month. Uh, so also on there is um, the project files link. So Ian's been kind enough to supply us with the ZBrush files for the assets that we're gonna be creating, not to give too much away, uh, as well as the two other links that we've just taken a look at, for example, events and the YouTube channel. And this is like the Dropbox link and already there is a little something on there. So oh. Ian, you you kind of have been like the mastermind behind this whole series, right? This is sort of like yeah. been been on you. So do you want to tell everyone um, a little bit about what we're going to be sort of covering over this whole series and then maybe a little bit about this like first week? Absolutely. Um, can I share my screen and I can kind of, I like the, I'll show a breakdown of unless course. you. Of course, let me. Awesome, cool. Yeah, no, cool. I've thrown it over to you. I've hit play. Everybody can see, can we see me see Z brush? Yes. That's working, perfect, yeah. okay, great. So um, yeah, as I was saying, mastermind. <laughs> Basically, uh, what I was trying to do was come up with a project that would actually look more complex than it actually is and allow um, anyone from complete beginner to intermediate, even advanced, the ability to follow along and maybe uh, discover some things about ZBrush that maybe you haven't been using or that you didn't know quite existed. Um, the idea behind it, again, was to include a little bit of everything from hard surface to grabbing assets within ZBrush and to also to kind of just create our own asset really, really quickly. With today, I want to do a crash course of just starting in ZBrush and then at the end, we'll end up with one of these little pumpkins here um, as a nice as a nice way to really just kind of get your hands sculpting with something that everybody's pretty much familiar with. And that's actually one of the biggest tips I can give before we do anything else within ZBrush. If you want to sculpt something or you want to get into sculpting something using ZBrush, just look around the house and grab something that is very familiar to you that you know how it looks and feels. And that's going to help you identify a little bit more on how to create something quickly. Because again, if, if you've seen it a lot, then it's easy to replicate, especially if you know it. So that's why we're starting off with a pumpkin. Plus, it'll also give us some time to move around and flow within ZBrush. Um, so again, we're going to be doing um, some asset creations like this zombie hand here. This was actually just an asset that I pulled within ZBrush that we'll get to in a minute, um, and then used a really simple trick to get this kind of uh, grittiness and kind of fleshy deterioration. And it's Halloween, so you know, it's gonna be good. Um, but yeah, so um, I thought, again, let's keep it simple, keep it nice and neat, but again, something you could be proud of, and even something that we can 3D print, which I will be prepping this current file for 3D printing. So yeah, probably be a newsletter drop, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I would say, should we just get into it? Should we start? Yeah, yeah let's let's do it. It. also to everyone who's watching live, ask as many questions as you want. Like we have in here, we have the ZBrush expert. We also have myself and Dustin if they're related to, you know, C4D or Redshift or kind of like importing or anything. Um, we want to keep it as interactive as we can. So your questions will be helping anyone who is on this live and watching this later on. So we'll try and answer as many as we can live. Absolutely. And also too, just a quick note, um, we will be getting into GoZ at uh, some point during these five weeks. So i just like to make note that if you are coming from Cinema 4D or you have Cinema 4D and you want to bounce back and forth using our GoZ tool, you'll want to install that on the Go on the Cinema 4D side. Um, and we can have Ellie showcase how to do that properly. Um, but we'll go ahead and that's the way you'll want to install it. So that way ZBrush can communicate back and forth. So let's go ahead and get into it. So you don't know ZBrush, or you might know ZBrush a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off here. Boop. Get the full, get the full screen happening. So we're gonna go in with the start that we don't know ZBrush at all, and I want to show you how quickly and effectively you could start using ZBrush today, because it might seem just a little bit daunting moving everything around. So at the very beginning, so I'm gonna clear it off as if, as if uh, we just launched ZBrush for the first time. And if you just launched ZBrush for the first time, 
This is very much what you're going to see in the beginning. You're going to see this pop up, which is actually our homepage that notifies all the events that we're doing or that are coming up very, very soon. Like we can see here, I have an event on the bottom right that is actually covering an image breakdown that happens tomorrow, where we bring on an artist and we talk to them about the image and scope that they've produced. And then, of course, the Demystify series and some other events. So when you get to this screen, you can go ahead and just hit the X button to close that down. And then you're left with this. So the way I like to teach starting in ZBrush really quickly is this banner up here at the top is called our light box. And inside of it holds assets and projects and things that you can access quickly to get started. And we're gonna pay attention to this one right here that is called the default project. And the reason why is because it's gonna set us up for success. So if we double click that, it's going to pop up with a little message saying, you're going to close the current project. Do you want to save? We didn't do anything, so the answer is no. And we're going to go ahead and open up a brand new project. And as you can see here, we actually have a sphere right out the gate. And it has symmetry turned on because we can see um, where our brush is with a big circle. And then on the other side, we have a little dot um, that indicates that we are working symmetrically. So this is immediately probably the best way to get started. And I would like to then move from how do we navigate within ZBrush. So it's very, very um, crucial that if you get into ZBrush full time, that you want to move away from using a mouse and using a pen pressure of some sort. I recommend like a very inexpensive XP pen or a Wacom um, tablet. Doesn't have to be a big Cintiq or anything like that. Just something that's that's uh, manageable and affordable. Um, and the reason why is because ZBrush uses pen pressure sensitivity, um, just like uh, Photoshop um, or any other drawing application. It uses the pen pressure so that we can actually push really, really hard, or we can go really soft and get some nice details. So using a tablet is really good, especially for detailing. But if you're just following along today, you can easily follow along with a mouse. So to move around in ZBrush, we have a couple ways to move. The first thing is left clicking or 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 with your mouse just pressing in this open space. And this will actually just start us kind of rotating. And this is where a lot of artists will just kind of grab the spot, rotate their model, and then move it around. To actually do a pan, um, to kind of pan your model around, you can actually press and hold Alt or Option on the keyboard if you're Windows or Mac. And then you click in the empty space. And while you're holding Alt, you can actually pan your model around. And then to zoom in and out, since we're already holding Alt and left clicking in this empty space, to zoom in and out, we just let go of Alt and this zooms in and out. Now, it, in the beginning, this feels a little weird. Um, what you can do is over on the right hand side, we have a move button that we could just click and move once, uh, move our, our pan or model around. We have our zoom button and we also have our rotate button. So these are a few different ways you can go ahead and get started. I really recommend trying you know, to get used to pressing and holding Alt to pan, letting go of Alt to zoom in and out, or just rotating, because this will be a lot quicker when you start working within ZBrush. But that's how you would go ahead and start navigating around. Now, to access our brushes, what we're gonna be doing is actually coming up to the left-hand side where it says brush and clicking this one time. And now these are, I would say like 60% of the brushes that ZBrush ships with. ZBrush ships with a lot of brushes. And that's because the idea here is that you can make pretty much anything you want in ZBrush. And we pretty much have a brush for you to do whatever it is you're trying to create. So you have a lot of different options, but a lot of artists will start with some simple ones like the Move brush. And so what you might notice with the brush palette is at the very top, there are letters. So we have B, C, D, all the way, the whole alphabet. And the reason why is when you hit B for brush, or you come over here and click this one time, we can actually use hotkey shortcuts to start organizing or, or weaning out the brushes we don't want. So for example, if we want the move brush, then we would go ahead and hit M for move, and then we can isolate where that move brush is. You'll also not notice that there are little orange uh, letters that appear next to that brush, and that is the hotkey shortcut for that brush specifically. So a lot of times when you hear me teaching on uh, ZBrush Live, which I stream every Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to noon specific standard time, um, 
I'll say things like, oh, we want the clay buildup. So I'll go B for brush, C for clay, and B for clay buildup. And now I have the clay buildup brush. And this is just a way that artists can move very, very quickly to grab a brush that they need and that they know. So that's that's the simple version of uh, our brushes. I definitely recommend, especially if you're brand new to ZBrush and you got to this far, just go ahead and try some different brushes. Like, oh, what does the chisel brush do? Oh, that's kind of cool. It kind of just like grinds that up a little bit. Control Z or commands or yeah, or command Z on Mac um, will actually do a um, history back. And Control Shift Z or Command Shift Z should go uh, for Mac will go forward. So you have Control Z options, and you'll see that little timeline up here as well, where you see this orange little dot. So you can slide this bar around if you want to go back that way too. But you just come in here and try some brushes, try the clay buildup brush, which is BCB, and then just see what this looks like. The move brush, which is B, and then M for move, and then V, and then you know, just kind of pick and move things around. So this is the brush indicator. Now there are two other brushes I haven't gone over. And don't worry about trying to memorize all this now because there is there is a lot of little things that um, you'll pick up on as we make this project. And like I said, we're gonna be making a pumpkin here in a minute. Um, so we'll be using a lot of these features, but with this, I figured best to give a nice little crash course. So the other two brushes um, that we're gonna be playing with, if we hold control, now if we look up here at the top left-hand side, where the brush palette is and I press and hold control, you'll see here I now have a mask pin brush. And control is our shortcut to isolate out of all these brushes, it'll actually isolate only the masking brushes. So pressing and holding control will automatically isolate. And while you're holding control, you can see here, I can actually come in and paint a mask. And this is good because let's say I wanna protect a certain area, and I'm sculpting with the standard brush, which is B, S, and then T. And I wanna actually protect this area. Now I can actually come through here and mask that area off and it's gonna protect that. So I don't have to worry so much about disrupting any of that geometry that I've built up. And then likewise, let's say I actually mask the section off, but that's the area I wanna sculpt. If I press and hold control and tap one time in the empty space, that actually inverts the mask. But you can also find that on this right-hand side menu under masking, and there is an inverse button. And so you could press that as well, but it's just much easier to hold control and press one time. And then you could come in and start sculpting in this area. So again, don't worry too much if I'm going too quick, because again, we'll be able to do a lot of this stuff as we're getting started. And then the last brush is the smooth brush, which I think is the most used brush, but I try to sway people from not using it so much. And that is pressing and holding shift. And the reason for that is because smooth, if we press and hold shift and then we start smoothing, it's going to completely just like pretty much wreck everything we have. It just smooths it down exactly as it says. Um, smoothing can happen very, very quickly. So be careful with it, but don't worry at the very top, we have some sliders here and we have an intensity slider. And if I press and hold shift, you'll notice that the intensity is at 100%. So we can actually bring that slider down and it will smooth at, not as aggressively as when it was at 100%, which is smoothing very fast. So these are the basic controls. I definitely recommend to kind of play with it a little bit, just like any other program, just getting used to what ZBrush is and how you can actually utilize it. It's about learning the tool and then from there trying to make something. So um, this will get you pretty started and I definitely recommend coming in and just starting to play a little bit. So do we have any questions so far? I don't wanna go too far too quickly, um, just in case. Yeah, we do. So. Rose was wondering, is there like a direct resource for these shortcuts? Is there like a document anywhere or? Yes, there is actually. And I could pull that up real quick. Boop, 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 boop. I should have had that ready. That's my fault. Uh, so let's see. So boop, boop, boop. let me pull that up. But there is absolutely. I like that this comes with sound effects, by the way. That is the rules. <laughs> that is absolutely. <laughs> um, that's just how I roll. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get that link and I'm gonna put it in the chat. So let's see here. 
Hopefully this is the right chat. Let me know if that came through. But that Ooh, will definitely yeah, I can see that. Cool. So yeah, Perfect. there's there's a lot of stuff in there. I think there's also a PDF in there somewhere that you can download as well. But yeah, definitely skim through there. But I, I will say that like it's it's much easier to try it a few times and then muscle memory. Um if you look at most people's uh, who use ZBrush, if you look at their alt key, it's pretty much doesn't read alt anymore. That's how often we use alt. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, based on that point, though, if there, this is um, probably the, the second most important thing um, and that you could probably remember if you take anything away from today is that the control button does one more thing other than mass stuff, and that is it actually provides solid information. So if you're coming through a menu, for example, like geometry, and you're hovering over Z remesher, and you're like, what does this actually do? If you press and hold control, it actually will pop up a short description of what that does. And this is built into every feature within ZBrush. So if I go to edge loop, now if I do it over a menu, it's not gonna work because the menu isn't the feature. But if I hover over edge loop, it's gonna tell me and sometimes show me a little graph of exactly what it does. And this will be important too, because ZBrush is all about exploring your artistic creativity. And if you're not sure what something does, we are like, well, let's find a way to go ahead and let you know. And so pressing and holding control over any button or any feature will pretty much give you all the information of exactly what it does. So definitely That's take so that cool. one. That is yeah. such a great feature. It's kind of, it's like a quicker version of like C4D's show help menu. Yeah, it's really cool. We really, really like it. And we're also like, we're always trying to think of ways to make that a little bit more easier as well. But yeah, it's it's probably the best thing you can do to just like, what does this actually do? It's like, oh, here's my MatCat material. So I'll explain what that material is. And then if you open up that menu and we'll get into that a little bit. I don't want to like blow too many minds too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did have another quick question if, if that's Perfect. cool. Yeah, absolutely, so from, bring it. Cool, so from Dave, uh, he's got his the file open that you supplied on the Dropbox, um, but he's asking how do I create like a new file or like a new scene to, to get started in with this sphere? Perfect, great question. So I'm gonna go ahead, and as you see here, I have a whole new scene that we started just as like what would happen. So um, we're actually gonna replicate, uh, it was Dave, right? We're gonna replicate yeah. um, your question right now. So I went ahead and loaded this tool in, and now we have this, but you wanna create a whole new scene. So the easiest way to do that is right up here at the very, uh, in this little tool palette area. I call this my subtool palette. Um, think of this as fresh canvases. So when you load in a scene, you're loading in a brand new canvas that you then are able to manipulate what was already started. But if you wanna start a new one, notice here we have some primitives. We have a star, we have a cylinder, and right now, because of how I loaded this scene, I have a sphere. But I also have the simple brush. So the easiest way to start a new scene is to click the simple brush one time, and it's just gonna say that our current active tool is already in edit mode, do you wanna switch? It's gonna knock it out of edit mode. So if you say switch, then we went ahead and we're left with just seeing a, a stamp of our scene, but we can't really manipulate it. So we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and press control N, which will clear our canvas. And I'll go ahead and get into that a little bit more in a second. And then if you click the simple brush one more time, notice that it's much bigger on my screen than it was over here. And that's because now we can click this and drag in a new primitive. So let's start with a cube just to be different. And we're gonna drag this out by left clicking in the scene one time and dragging that out. Now we can drag out multiple options. And if you accidentally do this, just go ahead and press Control N just to clear that because ZBrush has this thing called 2.5 painting mode. It's actually the foundation which ZBrush was built on. It started out as a painting program and quickly turned to a 3D modeling program when there was a lot of control functions for 3D already built in. So that's the mode in which you typically start out. So you would just drag out that cube and then we're gonna come on up to the very top and see that we have an edit button. We also notice that under the edit object, there's a, there's a letter next to it, T. That's the hotkey shortcut. So if I click T, that's gonna send it into edit mode. And then from here, I'm gonna go all the way over to the right-hand side under the tool palette, and we're gonna to make PolyMesh 3D. 
And if I click this one time, now my new scene has generated that is sculptable. So that's how you would load up a new scene. Perfect. And Thanks. Yeah. And I'll expand one more thing too. If you start ZBrush from scratch, like brand new, like kind of how we had done it before. Um, so let me go ahead and just clear this real fast. Um, so let's say we just started ZBrush for the first time. This is where we're at again with the home page. We close this down. Instead of hitting that default project, that's how you can load in your project the other way. You just come over, grab one of your primitives or that simple brush, drag it out press T for edit, make PolyMesh 3D, and that'll make it for sculpting. We'll get into a reason why you're gonna be clicking make PolyMesh 3D um, here in a little bit, because um, when we first engage ZBrush, we are engaging in 2.5 uh, D mode, but there's actually a lot of really good benefit to um, starting out in 2.5 that we'll get into a little bit later um, that you'll actually want to um, kind of when you're like wanting to customize a specific shape real quick, fast and in a hurry, like uh, the 2.5D mode has some special tools that will uh, allow you to actually adjust the shape and correct it and get something a little bit closer to what you want before going into sculpt mode. So we'll do that a little bit later this week, but that's definitely how you want to get started. Cool, thanks Ian. Just um, really quickly, oh wait, don't worry. I was about to ask Drake's question, but he's saying, never mind, he's sorted it. So yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Never mind. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So based on the time, let's make a pumpkin together. And again, this is perfect for everybody. So we're gonna go ahead and um, get started. Actually, before, sorry, real quick. Notice here on this under this tool palette, we have a lot of different tools. And let's say you load something, you're like, I just don't want this here anymore. There is a way to delete it. So if you have your scene like this, and you're like, I need to just kind of get rid of this, then what you can do is you can actually go under subtool where we'll see all of these subtool uh, parts that I have. That's what we call an object in ZBrush. And again, we'll be covering this as we go, so no worries. But if you hover down, there is a delete all. And if you just don't want the scene up here in your little canvas area, just go ahead and say delete all and then say okay. And it's gonna remove that from the top. So it's no longer there. And we can do this with pretty much anything. We could just come on up and say, yeah, we don't want these anymore. There's just way too much. If it doesn't fully delete it, it was probably one of the start files it actually came with. And then, you know, we just, yeah, it's just not there. So we don't really worry about it. But if you loaded it in for the first time, that's a great way to go ahead and delete it. So let's start making a pumpkin and we're gonna do it from a spear. So it doesn't matter if you have your cube and you follow along or if you have a sphere or you wanna bring in something brand new or even come and click this, this default project. Doesn't matter how you started, but we are gonna, I'm just gonna double click the default project just so we have a complete clear canvas and starting fresh. So I'm gonna double click that. Um, the way I brought that light box up, by the way, was either hitting this button here or hitting comma key on the keyboard as the hotcut uh, as the hotcut shortcut key. Um, you're gonna wanna use hot, uh, hot keys a lot in ZBrush, but like I said, you'll get comfortable with them. So to make a pumpkin is actually really fun. So however, you, uh, however shape, size, doesn't matter. We're gonna go ahead and start uh, introducing a couple tools. So the first tool we're gonna introduce is actually the move brush. So again, we're gonna hit B for brush, M for move and V for the move brush. And if that uh, hot cut shortcut, if that hot key shortcut is a little different for you, just again, when you hit M, just kind of uh, refer back to the letter that was next to that actual brush, which should be V. Um, and what we're gonna do is we have symmetry turned on. So if we just go ahead and just start grabbing, you'll notice that we're only grabbing two sides because symmetry is automatically turned on. But for a pumpkin, we actually want to grab more than the two sides. We wanna grab everything. So there is a feature uh, which is radial symmetry, which is huge in ZBrush. And so at the very top, you might notice all these different menus. And the menu we're gonna be focusing on today is actually transform. And the reason why I'm introducing this is because symmetry is the biggest Thing that we use the most in ZBrush and there are different ways to utilize it. And so in ZBrush, we actually have X axis, which is left to right. 
And then we have Z's axis, which is front to back. And we have our Y axis that's up and down. So a little bit different than some other uh, 3D programs that you might be familiar with. So with that in mind, we're gonna go ahead and go into transform. And I would like to have at least eight different radial uh, symmetry spots to go ahead and make my simple lines of ZBrush. And I would also like to be able to move around equally. So this will be the first time that we're gonna be activating symmetry and I'm modifying a little bit, but it'll be fun. So we're gonna go ahead and click the Y axis. And don't worry if you're like, if you don't remember this, because sometimes like I'd say for the first couple of years <laughs> of, of everything, like I'll come in here, I'll be like, okay, is it Y axis? Is it Z axis? Like which one is it? Sometimes you may not remember and that's okay because ZBrush will quickly tell you very fast. It's like, oh, all right, I have the Z on and that's not looking exactly the way I want it. So I wanna make sure I come in here and turn on Y. You can have all of them on, which th this just looks like craziness, right? You're just like, wee. <laughs> but honestly, like, you know, you can have them all on or you can turn only the one that you want, which is Y. And you can see here, we're now being able to move multiple sides at the same time. So we're turning on the Y symmetry and I'm turning on this button called radial, the radial count. And you can adjust that radial count. You can either have a couple or you can have a lot, completely up to you. But as you can see here, this can allow for some really cool shapes out the gate. And so this is how we're gonna be shaping our pumpkin. And again, ZBrush is, the idea of the program is to do things very quickly, but effectively. So we're gonna come on up to transform and we're gonna say, let's start with, Let's start with something like around eight. Now, if you notice here as I'm sliding, you'll actually notice that it actually kind of highlights in red. And this is because if you're sliding, but you're like, I really just want 10, you can actually type that in with your keyboard and hit enter, and then you can get 10. So it's up to you. You can either slide and get close to, or you can type it in and get about. And now here, I'm gonna go ahead and just start shaping my pumpkin. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start grabbing this a little bit. Um, for a bigger brush size, if you press and hold S, it's actually gonna allow us to quickly adjust our brush size. So we can come through and just start kind of shaping our pumpkin a little bit. And I think we're gonna do with a nice little kind of thick pumpkin. We'll get the base going, just kind of round it up a bit. And that's good enough. We're not gonna go super, super crazy, but what we will do is we'll create a little spot for the stem. So at the very top here, I'm gonna just adjust it. We're gonna go ahead and just start kind of pushing this in just a bit, just so we can have a spot for our stem at the top. And at the bottom, we'll do the same as well. We'll kind of just push that up a little bit. There we go. And again, we could do a light smooth if we would like by pressing and holding S and just kind of cleaning that up a little bit so it looks really neat. There you go. Now, if you do not have the wireframe on, I turn that on by accident all the time just because I like seeing my wireframe. I hit Shift F or there's a button down here called Polyframe if you would like to see the geometry in which uh, I am looking at. So you can have that on or off. Sometimes I have it on just because it's like, I just want to know how bad I'm destroying the mesh. <laughs> so now we have our basic pumpkin shape here. And now we're gonna go ahead and save. I wanna make sure I cover saving because I will tell you, I constantly am saving because I, I like to push ZBrush beyond its limits sometimes. So there are two ways to save in ZBrush. There is the, um, the way you're gonna want to naturally save, which is a project by hitting Control or Command S. This is like out the gate, the most common way to start. But what this is doing is actually saving a project. And if I'm just gonna go ahead and put this on the desktop and we'll call this our pumpkin. And then we're gonna go ahead and say block out because I like the name things. Uh, so I remember what I was doing there. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and hit enter to save. What this will do is a project will save not only all of the sub tools that you have here on your list, but it's gonna save your settings. It's gonna save the amount of sub tools that you or canvases you had built over here. and a lot of that can get very massive very quickly. So the first way to save is the project, but it's actually the way that I actually um, discourage saving in the beginning because project files can get unnecessarily big really quickly. And for that, you know, it just starts chugging your computer a little bit. 
The way I actually recommend saving is coming up to our tool menu and there's a save as button. And if I click this one time, now it's gonna save what's known as a ZBrush tool file. And that is gonna save only things that are within the sub tool. It will not save your settings, it will not save your history, and it will not save any of the random projects that are happening on the side. It's only gonna save the project that you're currently working on. And so I typically end up calling this pumpkin underscore zero one underscore block out. And the reason why is because now I'm very specific on the, the project that I'm saving. This Z tool will allow me to just save that that list of it. So I want to know exactly what I did and what that iteration is. But you save however you want. That's just kind of how I save. And I'll go ahead and say save. And now under my subtool list, you might see that my very first object has the name pumpkin underscore zero one underscore block out. And that's because when we save as ETL, it's only saving things within the subtool list. And because of that, it's going to take the very first subtool and name that subtool what it is so it remembers when it loads the next time. So what we what you might see a lot of projects, and I think you'll see it in mind, the one I gave you, <laughs> is that you might see, I'm gonna go ahead and just duplicate this real quick by hitting this duplicate button. You might actually see that the very first subtool is actually a little cube, which will look something like this. And I usually just have this eye turned off um, and that's so that it hides it each time. So that way the first subtool takes the name, but I can name this my, you know, I can name this my pumpkin. Uh, I can name this my pumpkins, you know, main or start or whatever I would like. So that's the two ways of saving um, in ZBrush. And that'll allow you to kind of, kind of get started. So um, to save however you would like, just remember that if you are saving a project file, it can get big quickly. So that would be how you save. Okay, I'm also keeping an eye on the time. So make sure we don't go too, too far over. All right, so are there any questions at this point? I don't wanna go too, <laughs> too far. Uh, yeah, so we've had a couple. A few you've actually been answering uh, after they've come in. So you must Perfect. be telepathic. Uh, Chad was wondering, what exactly is a subtool? Perfect. So a subtool in its short is an object within ZBrush. So we just call them subtools. I'm not sure where that name actually came from. So I should probably pick the guy's brain uh, who started the program. But um, a subtool is just an object. And you can have multiple subtools here in your list. So to add subtools or to take away subtools within your list, to add them, you come over to our subtool list, which is, again, defaulted on the right-hand side. And we can scroll down and we could say append or insert. Now, there are, there are two ways for a reason. The append will allow you to bring in an additional subtool that you would like, let's say like a plane, but it will not select that plane. It's going to keep us still on the object that we had. And this is that mindset of like, oh, hey, I'm going to need this object, but I don't need to work on it right this second, but I don't want to forget. That's kind of that thought process. It's like, drag this cube in or drag this plane in and then I'll manipulate it in a second. Um, or you need that, you are gonna end up projecting to that thing later, stuff like that. Um, the other way is insert. And to insert an object, you go ahead and say, same thing, you press insert and then let's say this cone, but then it automatically drops it in and it selects it in the very, very beginning. The only other difference between the two is that the insert will drop the object in below the thing you had selected, where append will drop it all the way down to the bottom of the list. So if I'm all the way up here and I say, okay, hey, append a ring 3D, it's gonna append at the very, very bottom. But if I say insert this terrain 3D, it's gonna insert exactly below the object that I want. And the idea behind that is, you know, you're working on something, you need an object that's probably corresponding to the one you're currently working on. So you're going to insert that. And that's trying to keep the hierarchy as clean as possible. So knowing that in the future, it, it, it's just a nice way to kind of work through. But in short, yes, this, uh, a sub tool is just an object within, within uh, ZBrush's 3D space. Now to delete said objects, let's say you brought something in or you don't need it anymore, you can just select that object by clicking one of the objects here and then coming down and saying delete. Now, this part's super important. 
the leading in ZBrush is kind of like the Achilles heel of a project. Um, I recommend saving before you delete too much too quickly because once you delete it, you cannot get it back. Um, so I recommend saving before you do so. So I'm gonna go ahead and say save and I'll show you why. So if we go ahead and say save and then I come through and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. And we have some options. We have cancel, which you can also just hit escape, which will do the same thing. We have okay, which will, will delete just one object. And we have always okay and, to, and skip this until I start Zebra or restart ZBrush. So let's say we're feeling kind of brazen and we're like, yep, always, I don't need that. And then I just hit delete, 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 delete. And then I'm like, well, I just deleted my whole project. That's fun. <laughs> the reason why I like save is because then what we could do is we can reload the project we just saved and we can do this multiple times. You can load the same project over and over and over again and it will always remember that last save state so you can if you accidentally delete let's say the whole project and you had saved very recently you could just come back and reload that project or in this case you know let's say i delete this pumpkin i can load this project back grab that pumpkin copy that and bring that back into my space here and then i can just delete the thing i meant to delete and call it a day. So saving is very important, but just remember deleting in ZBrush can be um, kind of the project ender. So saving often and making sure that your project is good. So if you accidentally delete something, you can access it back pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I love how you place so much emphasis on that. Um, I, I have done that many times when I first started learning ZBrush just start deleting things or moving things and, and it, it gets out of hand. So saving is definitely a good, <laughs> a good yeah. point here. Absolutely. No. All right. Any other questions before we move on? No, I think we're, we're all good. Carry Sweet. on. Awesome. All right. We're going to make the rest of our pumpkin, which is going to be really cool. So I've been talking a lot, but we're going to get there. I promise. Okay. So with our sub tool, here selected. Notice we still have radial symmetry turned on. You can see all these dots here. And so we're going to introduce a new tool, and that is going to be the Damien standard, or some refer to it as the DAM standard. Um, if you hear Damien standard or DAM standard, actually a little fun fact, the guy who made it, his name is Damien, so that's why it's called DAM standard or Damien standard. So random fun fact, history. So <laughs> we're going to go ahead and hit B for brush and D for the Damien standard, and then we're going to go ahead and hit S for the damn standard. I'm gonna say it both ways and you never know where I'm gonna go. And what we're gonna do now is you can see here with this radial symmetry, what this brush does is it actually carves our edges just the way we want. And you can see here, we already are coming through, just rotate around and we have our base pumpkin shape. Now notice though that our geometry does look and feel a little low resolution. And that's because we're working by default with the project we selected um, called Dynamesh. And what makes Dynamesh so unique and the way I'm gonna have you start using ZBrush is because it allows you to rebuild your geometry on the fly. So if we open up, if we close our subtool menu, so um, by opening a menu, we click it one time to close it, we click it again. Um, so we'll go ahead and close our subtool and let's go ahead and open up geometry by click, left clicking that one time. And now we're actually going to open up a box called or the menu sub menu uh, Dynamesh. And with this project that we started in the very beginning, which was right here, the default project, it actually defaults with Dynamesh turned on. Now to rebuild Dynamesh, you don't have to come over here and press Dynamesh and then restart Dynamesh. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is press and hold control and start to swipe your masking tool in the complete open space and then let go and it will rebuild on the fly. Now, if nothing changes or the button is turned off, you'll have to go ahead and turn that back on. But you can see here by swiping, it will rebuild that geometry. Now, it will rebuild that geometry based on the resolution of the uh, viewport, which is determined by the size of the objects within the viewport. And so what we can do is we can actually, underneath Dynamesh, we now have a sl resolution slider. And what this will do is we can actually drop a resolution to get bigger quads, or we can increase our resolution 
to get smaller quads, giving it more density and giving us a little bit more uh, room to hold information. So if I increase that resolution and then go ahead and control swipe, you can now see that my, my density has changed a little bit and now it's able to hold a little bit more resolution. So again, if we back up, we have a resolution slider. Default, it's usually around 64. Um, but if there's too much, if there's not enough geometry for the amount of detail you're trying to sculpt in, this is where you'll kind of like fight it a little bit. It may not look so good. So you'll just go ahead and you can slide it up a bit and then you can come through and rebuild. Now, a really cool fun fact with DynaMesh is that let's say you have multiple objects and you're not sure what resolution that is. Let's say you bring in an OBJ or STL and you want to DynaMesh it, but you don't want to come over here and be like, I think based on this one, it's a 64 and that's about the same size. So maybe it's 128. Instead of like thinking that way, we have a picker. And this, what this will do is we press and hold this picker button, come on over, it'll actually come over. If you hover over the resolution, it'll actually tell you what that resolution is. So let's actually kick this up a little bit. I'm gonna swipe that and then I'm gonna drop this resolution down. So you can see right now it's reading 72, but I'm gonna press and hold this picker and watch that 72 change. And now it's reading more like 140, 130. So this will give me a nice estimate of what this is actually at. I'll find the highest number that I think it can handle. And then I'll go ahead and redynamesh that and it will DynaMesh at that resolution. So that's a really cool, uh, really cool way to get that. And now with that resolution, I can come back in and redefine these shapes. Just kind of sculpt that in a little bit. Now it's a pumpkin, and pumpkins are nice and special, especially when they're not fully symmetrical. But let's say we're perfectionists or that we want to do something that's a little bit more stylized and we want that nice, uh, clean, crisp line. So I'm going to back it up and introduce this thing called Lazy Mouse. So let's go ahead and control Z or slider slider back in time until we get something like this, our original shape. There we go. So going backwards, and then I'm gonna go ahead and actually grab the DynaMesh. Because I did the picker, I know that I can increase the resolution to be more like 152. And now I'm gonna introduce the uh, Lazy Mouse by coming up to our next menu, which is Stroke, Lazy Mouse. And a lot of brushes have it default turned on, but it's at a lazy radius, which is the one we're gonna be focusing on today, of one, which basically means it's on, but it's not really on. It's there, but it's not doing anything. So we actually can slide that number up, which is the only thing we really need to touch right now. Later, we can go over what lazy step, lazy smooth, and lazy snap do. But for now, we're just gonna focus on lazy radius. And what this will do is we'll go really extreme for this uh, demonstration. But what this will do is provide us with a really long red tail. And then we can start dragging this out. And this will allow us to get really clean lines. This also brings in a really cool feature, which is when you start dragging this out, before you start sculpting, if you press and hold shift, you can drag out a straight line at any degree. So like this is nine degrees, 32, 33, and let go of shift, and you can actually get a really sharp straight line. So here, I could do something like this where I start here and I can either drag that shift out and cut it, or I can just come through and just use my nice smooth steady hand and drag that on out. And then I can also clean up my line a little bit more, come through and get nice cleaner lines. So this is a way that we can actually come through and get this set up. And you can either repeat this action by just trying to trace over it again and again and again. But you know, sometimes I can't be perfect in life. So I'm gonna introduce one more really cool feature, which is the adjust last slider, which is right up here at the top. And what the adjust last will do is that it will adjust the very last thing that you did on your sculpt or any point in time in which you've saved a history state. And this is really cool because a lot of times we're gonna be doing control Z a lot within ZBrush, especially if we make a mistake, you draw a line, make a mistake, draw a line, make a mistake, right? 
So, you know, let's say you spent a good amount of time getting a nice clean line and you're really happy with this. But you would like to make this a little bit, you know, a deeper cut. Then what you can do is at the very top here, we're going to take this orange uh, timeline and we're going to go back until there were no lines. And I'm going to press and hold control and put a history point. And then I'm going to drag this forward and come back to our current state. And now watch what happens with all of these lines when I do this adjust last, is that it's actually going to be pushing these in, giving me more detail with the lines I already created. And this is what this is how ZBrush just will really let us shine in our creative process. And now what we're going to do is redynamesh that so that we have something kind of cool. And now we're ready to move on to our stem. Now I'm going to kind of push through this just a little bit because I notice we are going to be running out of some time here and I want to make sure we build a full pumpkin. So we're going to insert a, another sphere. So I'm going to go ahead and insert our sphere here. And now I'm going to introduce the gizmo tool for you. So at the very top, we have uh, draw, move, scale, and rotate. Uh, we also have W, E, or R to uh, select scale, move, or rotate. But for this gizmo, this actually does all three at the exact same time. So if you just hit W, which you'll hear me say a lot, I can then be presented with this gizmo where I can drag the arrows, move it up. I can take this orange little, or sorry, this yellow little square and scale this down. I can squeeze this in. I can hold Alt and squeeze in the opposite direction. Um, I can take these little white, uh, little arrows and pan that around wherever I would like in space. But for what we're going to do now, I'm going to go ahead and just take this and put this right in the center. I'm going to kind of squish that down just a little bit, and that's going to give me a spot for my stem. And now I'm going to introduce a really fun brush that I love so much. It's near and dear to my heart, and it is the snake hook brush. So I'm going to hit B for brush, S for snake, and H for hook. And it's gonna give me a little warning message. All that warning message is telling me that this brush works better with Sculptures Pro. There's no time to go over that this time, so we're just gonna say okay and ignore that. Um, but we will cover that very soon. And what we're gonna do now is I'm just gonna go ahead with a decent brush size. I'm just gonna go ahead and pull this geometry out so it looks a little bit like a stem. I'm just gonna modify that. Now, what the snake hook does that the move brush doesn't is that it allows us to freely kind of snake hook that geometry around. Now it can get really messy quickly, but what's fun about this is that we can just kind of move a lot of mesh very, very fast and get a decent shape. And then from here, we can come through, go to our menu geometry, Dynamesh, and we can Dynamesh that. Now notice how my Dynamesh is not as clean as my original mesh, so let's Control Z, go to our picker, find a resolution. So this is actually at 216, turn on Dynamesh, and that looks a little bit better. And now we can go ahead and modify this. And if we would like to do a little neat thing where it looks like the stem is coming out of the pumpkin on all these intersecting parts, we can come back up to our transform, turn on active symmetry, turn on the Y axis with radial symmetry, and we can actually quickly and effectively push this in and get what we would like. And then we can turn off symmetry by hitting X on the keyboard, and we can kind of fine tune this a little bit and give it a little bit of asymmetrical feel or add in a couple other ones if we would like, and then Dynamesh it. And now we have a stem to a pumpkin. And we can finesse this all day long if we would like, but this is a nice little fun way to do that. We'll smooth that down a bit. Beautiful. All right. Okay. And let's see, any other questions so far? Yeah, so just quickly, that final brush, was it B S H for yes. snake hook brush? Yep. So B and then S for snake and then H for hook. And there it is. 
Yep. Cool. I had a quick question, actually. So, you know, yeah. when you got that second sphere and you used your move scale and rotate to kind of like squish it down, could you do the exact same thing on any of the geometry? So on the pumpkin, for example, could you select that as an object and then like squish that down as well? Absolutely. So I can turn on this pumpkin and I can squish it. Oh, absolutely. Perfect. If you have symmetry turned on, um, that's radial symmetry. Let me turn that off and go back to regular symmetry. Uh, doo -ba -doo, doo -doo 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 -doo, turn off radial. There we go. If we have symmetry turned on. Sometimes what this will do is actually allow you to manipulate the mesh equally with symmetry as well. So if you have symmetry turned on, you start moving something, you'll you'll get some fun shapes like this. And just as a like kind of neat little teaser for um, future Gizmo videos. We have a few different things here at the top. Um, we have a home button where this will actually send the object from its current point home. Um, ZBrush's home is always floating. It's not like uh, Cinema 4D where there's a specific point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a specific point in, in space where thing is considered home. Um, in ZBrush, home is where the subtool's at. <laughs> but there is a basic space where everything will try to snap to. Um, but your home position can vary depending on where the object is residing and the shape of the object. So if you have an asymmetrical shape, while there is a spot in, in time where you go ahead and say home, it's going to snap to that position. But let's say the gizmo is over here and then you say home, right? Well, it's it's homing based on the gizmo's location to the subtool. So it's kind of throwing it in a, in a weird space. So you'll always want to make sure that your subtool is, or that your gizmo is as centered to the subtool as possible and then send that home. Um, there are other ways that we can do as well, but um, that's one of the neat little things with the gizmo. We have an icon, um, like an unmasked mesh center space, which again, what that will do is kind of center the gizmo to a specific spot within that subtool. So if I over here hit that and I'll recenter the gizmo to the subtool, we have um, a kind of alt un, uh, un, undo, oh, unlock, sorry, where um, the lock icon, sorry, that's the one I'm trying to hover over. Um, this unlock will actually allow you to move the gizmo without moving the subtool. Um, so we can go ahead and actually lock that and now that's moved here. Um, and then the other important one, which is really, really cool, is actually the cog or the customize. This actually has a lot of neat features that we can cover in the future um, that will allow us to actually do some really fun creative shapes. Like, let's say, like, we want to bend this a little bit. So the gizmo has a lot more options. It's not just the thing that you could rotate scale and pivot. So we definitely have some stuff in there that would be good. And we'll cover a lot more of the gizmo itself in future videos. Cool. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I I know that was a lot. I'm sure that was a lot. But welcome to ZBrush. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. I mean, it, it is a lot when you're first stepping into a into a, a new software. But you definitely crushed it on a very quick one hour introduction to anything. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. based on a, a lot of the comments. People are saying they've never seen or had like a more clear and concise explanation. Like Drake was saying, he's been fully following along everything makes total sense um so a lot of yeah mind blown loving this a lot of really great comments and i'd agree like for me i'm learning along like with everyone here um and yeah i thought that was a really great great hour and i'm excited for the rest of the series for sure awesome well i will i will say everybody who's playing with zebras right now make sure that you kind of take this week to play with it a little bit more, um, go over this uh, again and again a few times, because as we go deeper with ZBrush, it might seem more complicated the first couple times you um, you start kind of going over it, it, you know. But once you do it a few times, it's going to make a lot more sense, and then you'll get a lot more comfortable. ZBrush is definitely the pinnacle tool of the look 80/20 rule. 80% of my work can be done with only 20%. You don't have to learn every menu and every facet within ZBrush. You just have to know what the tools do and then use those to your advantage because you're the artist, you're the creator, you're in control of this program. Um, where things are, mm -hmm. it's going to become a little bit more 
uh, easy to digest the longer you're in it. So this is definitely a um, experience type program that will only give you uh, more understanding the more you use it. Cool. Mic and drop. as a reminder, you get, oh. you got a, there you go. All right. <laughs> so I just quit it, quit it now. <laughs> no buy, just quit it. <laughs> I'm just going to say awesome. as a quick reminder, because um, I think Maurice was asking, yes, this has been recorded and yes, it will be uploaded onto the Maxon training team YouTube channel. So everyone can go back and rewatch this amazing hour that I agree has gone so fast. Yeah. But, yeah, looking forward to yeah, that, as hour it that is. was the fastest hour we've had in a long time. That that was very good. Yes. Awesome. Well, also, again, yeah. if, like for everyone who has maximum one, you already have ZBrush. So get sculpting. We we want to see we want to see these kind of like pumpkins. Like if you can follow along with this series, I know I'm going to be doing it, and I don't mind. I will gladly show my embarrassing sculpts of this yeah. next week and we can all have a good laugh at me i do not mind that perfect awesome well i will say if anybody does make a pumpkin using this in zebrush my my handle for everything on social media is ir sculpts you can find me very quickly ir stands for my name ian robinson so feel free to tag me with maxon's tag as well that you did this that you followed along and i would love to look at every single pumpkin you guys do and i'll even comment so that's a challenge you guys can do it <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm definitely going to be doing the same. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Well, right. yeah, I guess we should wrap up because we're a couple of minutes over, but you know, standard us, we do love to overrun. But yes. thank you so much, Ian. And that was an amazing hour. And thank you, Dustin, for being on here as well, answering questions in the background. And thanks to everyone who's still watching live. We really appreciate yes. you. And thank we'll you. see you next Monday for part two. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. And you guys take it easy. Have a great one, everybody. Talk to you guys. Yeah. Later. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Right. See you soon, Bye. everyone.